he wheels a loss function ft and the learner incurs a loss ft of xt in the t iteration so note that uh, we will only get to know ft after we play xt and the goal of the learner here is to minimize the following notion of regret here uh, the first term is the cumulative loss suffered by the learner over uh, t iterations and the second term is the benchmark term which is the loss of the best action in hindsight and uh, regret measures how well we do compared to the best action in hindsight uh, the framework of online learning has uh, several applications uh, ranging from recommender systems to online ad place placement to solving uh, two player and multiplayer games uh, here i will present its uh, application to solving uh, two player games so let's consider the linearized uh, statistical game which i presented a few slides ago uh, a standard approach for solving such games is to let both the min and the max players play a repeated game against each other and uh, rely on online learning algorithms to choose their actions so here uh, we first instantiate an, an online learning algorithm for the min player and one for the max player uh let qt comma pt be the iterates chosen by the min and the max players in iteration t then uh at iteration at time step t the online learning algorithm for the min player uh observes a loss expected value of pt r of theta and similarly the online learning algorithm of the max player observes a loss negative expected value of qt uh, r of theta hat uh here is a very standard result on the convergence of this uh, repeated gameplay if both the players use uh vanishing regret algorithms to choose their actions uh what i mean by vanishing regret is that the regret of these algorithms uh, is little of t so then we can show that this repeated gameplay converges to a nash equilibrium of the game uh one crucial thing to note here is that the losses observed by the max player are non convex in our case this is because the risk r is usually a non concave function in theta as a result the max player has to use regret minimizers which can guarantee um, vanishing regret even for non convex losses and in the next few slides um, we are going to design online learning algorithms for non convex losses which can help us solve uh, statistical games so let me provide uh, a little bit of historical background on online learning actually uh, it has a very rich history and dates back to uh, 1950 by the work of uh, brown and von neumann uh, most of the work on this problem has focused on convex losses in this case uh, we have several algorithms which achieve the optimal regret guarantees by regret i mean uh, the regret scales as uh, square root t Uh, by optimal uh, uh however uh, in our case we would like to extend such regret bounds to non convex case where the loss functions ft are uh, non convex however uh, the non convex case is uh, computationally intractable this is because even when fts are all the same then the problem reduces to offline non convex optimization which we know is uh, np hard in general so without any further help we can't really hope to do anything in the general non convex case uh to get around this np hard barrier practical approaches for online non convex learning uh, assume access to an offline oracle which can solve certain optimization problems um i will describe what this offline oracle is in a few slides but the point is uh, this assumption of offline oracle simplifies our problem a little bit because we are pushing the np hardness of the problem into this oracle and only focusing on the online learning aspect of the problem and this is a setting uh, we'll be looking at in this talk so let me now describe our main result in this setting suppose uh, the sequence of loss functions fts seen by the learner or lipschitz uh, they could be non convex 
And suppose we have access to a certain offline optimization oracle. And in this setting, we can show that we can get a regret rate of square root t, which is tight even in the convex setting. Uh, one thing I would like to mention here is that uh, the recent result of Agarwal et al. was the first result in this setting. However, uh, they get a regret of t power two thirds, uh, which is uh, highly suboptimal. And we actually show that this can be improved to the optimal square root regret. So let me now uh, describe our algorithm. Uh, the algorithm we study is called follow the perturbator. Uh, actually, the algorithm is very simple. Uh, the prediction of the learner in iteration t is obtained by solving the following problem. The objective has uh, two components. Uh, the first term is nothing but the losses we observed till now. And the second term is the random perturbation, which is drawn uniformly from a hypercube of length uh, square root t. And to efficiently implement this algorithm, uh, we assume access to an offline oracle, which can solve this uh, optimization problem for us. Uh, this is a reasonable assumption because this offline oracle can be efficiently implemented for many problems uh, by leveraging the rich body of work on uh, global optimization. Hey, uh, I had a quick question. So is the offline oracle supposed to give an exact answer or is it supposed to give some additive approximations okay or something like that? Yeah, so additive approximations are fine. Uh, yeah, we don't need the okay. exact answers. Yeah. But multiplicative probably is not okay, right? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, we are trying to work with, uh, yeah, that's a current question we are trying to analyze. Uh, yeah, okay. but it's still open. I mean, it's, there is not, not many results known if you have multiplicative approximation oracles. So, yeah. Um, yeah, as I was saying, uh, this oracle can be efficiently implemented for a lot of problems of interest. In fact, I will show how to do this for some problems later on uh, when we deal with the statistical, so how to solve statistical games. Um, yeah, and that point I would like to note here is that for linear loss functions, and that is when FTs are linear in X, uh, this algorithm has been studied by Kala and Vempala. And they show that uh, it achieves the optimal square root regret. And in our work, we show that it achieves the optimal regret even in the general non-convex setting. Uh, actually, in the interest of time, uh, let me not go into the proof of our result. However, I'll be happy to talk about this uh, offline. Um, so instead, yeah, I will jump to the next part of my talk on uh, optimistic variants of the FT FTPL algorithm. So these variants achieve uh, better regret bounds than FTPL and lead to faster algorithms for solving uh, two player games. So let me explain what, this, what I mean by this. So in many applications of online learning, uh, the loss functions we see are not truly adversarial. Uh, they are often benign and predictable. So one example of this is the application of uh, online learning to two player games. Here, uh, the sequence of loss functions seen by the each player are actually not truly adversarial because the other adversaries, uh, the other player is not actually trying to be adversarial to you. In fact, the other player is helping you to converge to an Ash equilibrium. So, and algorithms such as FTPL can't really make use of the benignness in the problem to achieve better regret bounds. And in such scenarios, we would like to design algorithms which can make use of predictability of the loss functions uh, to achieve better regret guarantees. And the main reason we are interested, interested in such algorithms is that they can lead to faster algorithms for solving uh, two player games. Um, let me provide a little bit of uh, background on this problem. Actually, there has been some work on online learning with uh, predictable losses. Uh, when the loss functions are convex, optimistic variants of online mirror descent and follow the regularized leader have been studied. And these methods try to be optimistic about the loss sequence. And uh, they try to incorporate a prediction of the future loss into the calculation of the next decision. Uh, however, 
we are more interested in FTPL and optimistic variants of uh, FTPL. Unfortunately, uh, there is very little work on uh, optimistic variants of FTPL, both in convex and non-convex settings. We do not know much about optimistic FTPL. And in our work, we actually study an optimistic variant of FTPL and show that it achieves better regret guarantees than FTPL. So let me first uh, describe this algorithm. The algorithm is a slight modification of FTPL. Uh, the prediction of the learner in iteration T is obtained by solving the following problem. Uh, the objective is similar to the objective of FTPL except for one difference. The objective now has an additional term GT, which is our guess for the future loss function FT. And the random perturbation sigma is now drawn uniformly from a hypercube of length uh, eta. If GT is zero, then we recover the FTPL algorithm. And if our guess is good, uh, then we can expect the regret of OFTPL to be small. And uh, this is indeed the case. And we actually show that the regret of OFTPL depends on the quality of our guess. So here is our main result on the regret of OFTPL. Suppose the sequence of loss functions FT are Lipschitz. Again, they could be non-convex. Uh, then we show that the expected regret of uh, optimistic FTPL is uh, bounded as follows. Uh, it can be seen that the regret only depends on uh, FT minus GT, which measures the quality of our guess about the future loss function. If GT is zero, then we, uh, then by setting the noise eta to square root T, we recover the regret of uh, FTPL algorithm. And if GT is equal to FT, uh, uh, that is, uh, we are able, if we are able to predict the future exactly, then setting the noise term to zero gives us uh, zero regret. Uh, in general, if FT minus GT is small, then we can expect the better than square root to regret for OFTPL algorithm. Uh, due to the lack oh. of time, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I just had one question about like, what's the norm that you're measuring the error in? Uh, this is a Lipschitz norm. Uh, that's a Lipschitz constant of FT minus GT. Um, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Because yeah. these are general functions. And yeah, yeah, these are, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but uh, that can be relaxed to other norms as well, uh, like L infinity norm and other norms. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, due to the lack of time, uh, I'm not going into the proof of this theorem here. Uh, but one last thing I would like to mention about this algorithm is that when used for solving smooth, two-player games, optimistic FTPL converges at a faster rate than FTPL to a Nash equilibrium. So in particular, uh, OFTPL converges at one over T rate, whereas FTPL only converges at uh, one over square root T rate. So let me now uh, briefly summarize some of the key takeaways from this part of my talk. Uh, first, we showed that FTPL achieves the optimal regret even when the loss functions are non-convex. Uh, next, uh, FTPL needs access to an offline optimization oracle. And for many problems, this oracle can be efficiently implemented using global optimization. Uh, we also looked at optimistic FTPL algorithm, uh, which achieves better regret guarantees for predictable sequences. And it helps us converge faster to Nash equilibrium in two-player games. And finally, uh, our results have applications to solving uh, non-convex, non-concave games, uh, which I will talk about pretty soon. And it also has applications to other problems such as contextual bandits and uh, in differential privacy. So this brings an end to the first part of my talk on online learning. Uh, but before I proceed, I would like to see if there are any questions. I have a question that um, yeah. you may get to, so you could just, uh, I'll ask it and then if you tell me you're gonna get to it. Yeah. So you're gonna produce to me a minimax estimator, yeah. right? Yeah. Are you gonna characterize um, its large sample properties? Are you going to tell me how to get um, estimates of uncertainty associated with that? Or are you just gonna produce to me 
uh, an estimator? So for any given n, the number of samples, I will give you the algorithm is going to return an estimator. And uh, the estimator turns out to be, uh, yeah, you can characterize the worst case risk of that estimator based on the hyperparameters you chose for the algorithm. Uh, so, so the large sample properties, uh, actually we are not, uh, yeah, we are not gonna talk, any, talk anything about the large sample properties because uh, all we care about is for this particular n, uh, what's the worst case risk and our algorithm, and we can characterize that based on the hyperparameters we chose for the algorithm. So as a statistician, um, you know, I'm used to characterizing uncertainty. So there's some true value of the parameter, right? And we're, mm -hmm. we, we want to estimate it. But then we also, our estimation procedure comes with some uncertainty because, you know, we just have mm -hmm. a sample yeah. from maybe some, um, mm -hmm. you know, so how do yeah. I think about uncertainty in this? How, how do you as a computer scientist think about uncertainty? So by uncertainty, I'm assuming, are you talking about some confidence intervals Confidence estimates. interval or some other measure of uncertainty. So yeah, as of now, uh, we haven't looked into that yet to see uh -huh. what we can say about uh, uncertainty of our estimators. All we are looking at only as of now is the worst case risk guarantees. Um, but I feel uh, our estimators actually, uh, the estimators output by our algorithm are nothing but base estimators for some priors. So I believe maybe that might be a good starting point to understand the uh, uncertainty properties of our estimators. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Also, if your loss is something like the square loss or something like that, don't you automatically get some kind of confidence mm -hmm. intervals via Chebyshev or something like that? Um, I think it really depends on your estimator, not the loss. Uh, so the estimator could itself be really complex, in which case I would say getting a confidence interval might turn out to be hard. Uh, but again, we can always use some techniques like bootstrap or something to get uh, confidence intervals, but they may not be tight, but we can all, always use uh, bootstrap techniques. Yeah. Well, that's a, so, <laughs> so bootstrap doesn't always work, right? There are, there are regularity conditions under which bootstrap yeah, yeah, yeah. work, which are typically some underlying normality kinds of things. So yeah. you can do it, but I don't know if it's uh, necessarily gonna work. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, I'm not claiming it's going to work, but yeah, definitely. I'm just saying that that could be one thing which we can try if we have some nice properties for our estimators, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I will now uh, get back to the problem of uh, minimax statistical estimation and use the FTPL and OFTPL algorithms to solve the statistical game. So recall uh, in minimax estimation, uh, we would like to solve the following uh, linearized statistical game where R of theta hat comma theta is the risk of an estimator theta hat when the true distribution is uh, P theta. And to solve this game, uh, we let both the min and the max players uh, play a repeated game against each other. And due to various theoretical and practical reasons, uh, we let the max player rely on FTPL and the min player rely on uh, best response. So let me uh, unpack this a little bit for you. Uh, let theta hat t comma pt be the iterates produced by the min and the max players in the teeth iteration of this uh, repeated gameplay. Then first, the max player produces PT, which is the probability distribution of uh, theta T of sigma uh, using FTPL and reveals it to the min player. Then uh, the min player produces theta hat T using uh, best response and reveals it to the max player. So what I mean by best response is that uh, the min player is computing the minimizer of the expected risk with respect to PT. Uh, to put this in uh, statistical terms, the min player is actually computing the base estimator for prior PT. So to get back to the earlier question, which Aditya asked, uh, we need not actually store theta hat t. Uh, all we need to store is PT or uh, some surrogates for PT. And once we store PT, we can always compute the base estimator for uh, PT and use it as uh, theta and uh, compute theta hat t always. So, so I thought you were minimizing over Q. Yeah. 
So Ends minimization over Q will always, since it's a linear optimization problem, the minimizer will always be over a, at the vertex. So you can just search over uh, deterministic estimators. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? So you're saying- uh... So yeah, the actual minimization problem is over Q. Uh, yeah. I agree with that. But then uh, uh, the objective that you are minimizing over is actually a linear function over Q. And since linear optimization problems have their minimizers at the vertices of your uh, constraint set, uh, you can always uh, uh, equivalently write that optimization problem as minimization over a discrete uh, deterministic estimator theta hat. Uh, so am I clear? Uh, so it's a, just a simple result on uh, the minimizers of a linear optimization problem being on the vertices of your constraints. So I get that, but then how do you grab this theta hat T? Is that, so you have a distribution, right? Over theta hat T. So what is, what is mm -hmm. theta hat over theta hat? What is the theta hat T that you're grabbing? Uh, yeah, theta hat T is the minimizer of your, uh, this base risk uh, with respect to prior PT. I see, okay. Yeah. I guess, and that depends upon what loss function you're using. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you're the using loss squared error loss, it would be the mean or something like that. But if you were using L, you know, L1, you would use the yeah. median or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. It depends on your risk function, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, as I was saying, uh, these min and the max players uh, use, uh, are, are involved in this repeated gameplay and the max player responds in every iteration using FTPL and the min player responds using uh, best response. And this uh, process continues uh, every iteration. Uh, here is a standard result on the convergence of this repeated gameplay to a Nash equilibrium of the game. Uh, let theta hat rand be a randomized estimator obtained by uniformly sampling an estimator from the uh, theta one hat to theta t hat, which are the traits uh, generated by our algorithm. Then what we can show is that this theta hat rand uh, is an approximate uh, minimax estimator. Um, by approximate, what I mean is that the worst case risk of theta hat rand is within one or square root T of uh, the best possible worst case risk. Uh, one important thing I would like to note here is that if instead of relying on FTPL, let's suppose the max player relies on uh, optimistic FTPL then the algorithm actually converges at uh, one over T rates to a Nash equilibrium. And uh, this requires a risk to satisfy certain uh, smoothness assumptions. So I noticed that you don't put an O, so, you know, uh, that you're not, you're, you're, you have a capital O here, but you're not thinking of this as a random quantity. Like uh, theta hat rand is not itself a random variable, a random whatever vector. Or Yes, it's a random quantity and all these our results hold in high probability. Uh, like okay, so there, there really should a, be like an O sub P here or something like that when you're yeah, yeah. So O notation. With, yeah, so I'm ignoring some details like uh, with probability at least one minus delta, we can show that uh, uh, the worst case risk of our estimator is within one or square root three times log one. Got it, delta. okay. So there's a probability concept here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's an extremely low probability event that this phase, yeah. No, I understand, thank yeah. you. Uh, so yeah, the above theorem shows that the algorithm theoretically outputs an approximate minimax estimator. Of course, to make this algorithm practical, uh, we need to be able to efficiently implement the update steps of both the players. So I will now look, uh, talk about how to efficiently implement these update steps for uh, various problems. So in general, uh, the update steps are hard to implement. Uh, this is because the update of the max player involves uh, maximization of non-concave problem, which is NP hard in general. Moreover, uh, the update of the min player involves optimization over the set of all estimators, which is uh, infinite dimensional. Uh, nonetheless, the update of the min player, uh, which involves base estimation, is a well-studied problem. And we can leverage the rich body of work on Bayesian estimation to efficiently implement this step. And similarly, the update of max player can be efficiently implemented by relying on uh, global optimization techniques. 
uh, while this is good, we can actually do much more. Uh, very often, we can also rely on problem structure to reduce the computational complexity of these update steps. And one example of problem structure I will now talk about is uh, called symmetry and invariances in the problem. So I will now define uh, what an invariant statistical game is and show you how invariants can help us reduce the computational complexity of the update steps. Informally, uh, a statistical game is invariant to group transformations G. If the game remains the same, even after transforming the data using group trans some group transformations. For example, uh, the problem of uh, normal mean estimation is invariant to orthogonal group transformations. This is because uh, L2 norm is invariant to uh, orthogonal transformations. So we have the uh, following theorem for such invariant games. Uh, suppose the statistical game is invariant to some group transformations G, then what we can show is that it suffices to solve the following uh, reduced statistical game. Uh, the reason for calling it a reduced game is that the domain of the min and the max players are smaller sets. So to be precise, uh, the domain of the min player is now over the set of all invariant estimators. Uh, by invariant, I mean, uh, what I mean is that if you transform the data using some transformation G, then the output of this estimator also gets transformed accordingly. And the domain of the max player is now over the set of all equivalence classes of theta over G. Uh, this is usually a much smaller set than capital theta. For example, if capital theta is an L2 ball and G is a group of orthogonal matrices, then theta slash G is a one dimensional set. And if we run our uh, FTPL based uh, algorithm on this reduced game, then the update steps will usually be much easier to implement. And in some cases, these update steps are reduced to simple one dimensional problems. Uh, I will now present some examples of uh, statistical estimation problems and show how the tools and techniques uh, we developed until now help us design minimax estimators. So let's revisit our first problem, which I discussed in the beginning on a finite Gaussian sequence model. Uh, just to recap here, we are given a single sample X, which is generated from a normal distribution with uh, mean theta and identity covariance. And we assume the L2 norm of theta is bounded by B. And here we, for this problem, we would like to design a minimax estimator. And this leads us to this following min-max game, where uh, the risk of an estimator theta hat is measured with respect to squared L2 loss. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, this problem has a very rich history in uh, statistics. Uh, however, surprisingly for B greater than 1.16 square root D, uh, we don't know exact min-max estimators. And we show that uh, using our algorithmic estimators, we can uh, probably construct minimax estimators for this problem. Uh, for this problem, uh, we can show that. So, uh, just yeah. to uh, clarify, like, uh, so your estimator just looks like something, some scaling factor times t, that scaling factor carefully depends, uh, times x, sorry, and the scaling factor depends on this mm -hmm. b in some careful way, is it? Yes, yeah. I see, I see. And uh, in, in a lot of these things, can you, uh, uh, I mean, since you can quantify the min-max risk, can you compare what people often study to the ones that you, that you generate? Maybe not for this. Yeah, problem, I'm gonna present the experimental results soon, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so for this problem, actually, we can show that the statistical game is invariant to orthogonal group transformations. So we can use our theorem on invariance games and solve the reduced uh, statistical game. And it turns out that solving the reduced game is very easy in this case. In fact, uh, the update steps of both the players only involve solving one dimensional optimization problems, which can be efficiently solved using uh, grid search. So we now present uh, some experimental results here. Uh, the following table compares the worst case risk of uh, our algorithmic estimators 
with other baselines for various values of uh, b and d. So if you recall, b is the size of the domain and d is the dimension. I'm just uh, presenting some uh, sample results, but uh, yeah, more results can be found in the paper here for larger dimensional problems. So if you see here, we are comparing our algorithmic estimator with uh, other baselines such as the standard estimator, which predicts theta, uh, theta as x, and uh, the other two estimators are MLE and James Stern estimator. So definitely uh, in terms of worst case risk, we perform better than MLE and the standard estimator. And we also have slightly better performance than uh, James Stein estimator. Um, so the next example I will present uh, is a problem of uh, entropy estimation. Here again, just to recap, uh, we are given n samples generated from a discrete distribution which is supported on d elements. And our goal is to estimate the entropy of this distribution. And this leads us to this following min-max game where the risk of an estimator f hat is measured with respect to squared loss. Uh, just to uh, recap, uh, these, uh, again, this problem is well studied. And recently, uh, there is a minimax estimator which has been uh, proposed by Giao et al. Uh, in a very recent work. So, yeah, uh, it turns out that this problem is invariant to the actions of the permutation group. So we can again use our theorem on invariance games and solve the reduced uh, statistical game. Uh, in this case, the update step of the max player is not exactly a one dimensional optimization problems. Uh, so we rely on global optimization techniques to implement these update steps. Uh, we now present some experimental results. Uh, the following table compares the worst case risk of our algorithmic estimator with other baselines. Uh, the one is a plugin MLE, uh, which is a very standard estimator that we use in practice. And it turns out that in the high dimensional settings, this plugin MLE turns out to be very suboptimal with a very bad worst case risk. And moreover, our algorithmic estimators have very similar performance as uh, the minimax estimator of uh, Gio et al. Uh, this is interesting because it took decades of work to design minimax estimators for entropy estimation. And we are able to do this algorithmically uh, very efficiently in a very short time frame. So the fact that you are suboptimal, is it just because you've not run it till convergence or something like that? Yes, I think it's just a boils on to, yeah, if you run it for more iterations, it should be optimal, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, in this slide, uh, we compute the risk of our estimator for entropy estimation on various distributions uh, that occur in practice. So it is well known that many real world discrete distributions follow a power law decay. So we generate distributions with various power law decays and compare the risks of uh, various estimators. So it can be seen that our estimator has uh, similar performance as the minimax estimator of Gio et al and has a much better performance than the standard plugin estimator. Uh, so I would like to now summarize, uh, quickly summarize the key takeaways uh, from this part of my talk. Uh, first of all, we looked at algorithmic approaches for constructing minimax estimators. Uh, we reduced the problem of minimax estimation to online non-convex learning. And this requires uh, efficient implementation of the two update steps in our algorithm, which I talked about. Um, and I showed that various kinds of problem structure can be used to efficiently implement the update steps. Uh, one particular structure we looked at in this talk is symmetry and invariances in the problem. Actually, uh, there are several other kinds of structure we can rely on. And for those of you interested in knowing more about it, uh, please uh, refer to our paper. So before I conclude, I would like to present uh, some of my other past and ongoing works uh, that I've done during my PhD. Uh, at a high level, I'm interested in contributing to algorithmic advances in online learning game theory uh, while addressing the statistical problems. So in this talk, uh, I have mostly presented my work on minimax statistical estimation. Uh, and in an ongoing work, we are constructing minimax estimators for other fundamental problems such as 
regression and uh, covariance estimation. Uh, during my PhD, I also worked on other problems at the intersection of uh, game theory and statistics. Uh, my ongoing work on boosting aims to design generalized boosting algorithms, which allow for non-additive combinations of weak classifiers. So this is unlike traditional boosting, which builds additive combinations of weak classifiers. Uh, these additive combinations usually lack representation power and can't really model complex data sets such as ImageNet. So here we are designing uh, generalized boosting algorithms which have similar performance as uh, neural networks. Uh, next, uh, I'm also currently working on uh, emerging problems in machine learning such as robustness and generative adversarial networks. Uh, many existing works here rely on heuristics to solve the games associated with these problems. However, uh, these are not guaranteed to find an optimum. So here I'm working on using the FTPL and OFTPL toolkit uh, that I presented in the talk to efficiently compute the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium of the games. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks. You mentioned um, mm -hmm. in the middle of the talk somewhere, you said, um, you know, when you made the move um, mm -hmm. from sort of doing the min max over the theta, theta hat, and then mm -hmm. you said, okay, we're now going to do all this probability distributions. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. you said, oh, so I got this probability distribution. I can just treat it like a corrupted, you said something like I could treat, treat it like it, you know, an estimator with a corrupt, with a corruption or something like that. Do you remember that? Uh, a corrupted. So it's like it's, when you went to the bilinear thing. Yeah, it's not really a corrupted thing. What I mean is just a randomized estimator. Uh, so instead of a deterministic estimator, we are now getting a, the algorithm outputs a randomized estimator. Oh, and then you so, basically that's when you did the Bayes the Bayes um, estimator, right? Yeah, yeah. So and that randomized estimator can be converted to a deterministic estimator. That's what I mean. But by doing, the Bayes esti by doing the Bayes estimator? No, not by the Bayes estimator. We can just average all the uh, uh, outputs of all the estimators, and we can show that that will still be uh, min-max optimum. You mean the average of the T? Is that what you mean? Yeah, the average T, of the all sequence? the... Yeah, yeah. Or you the take sequence. the average of the outputs of theta 1 hat to theta hat T, yeah. and you can show that it's still min-max optimum. Yeah. yeah. Can you give me a sense of the computational complexity? I mean, I know you talked about how you reduce mm -hmm. the complexity of the computation, but I, I don't have a sense of like mm -hmm. to produce those tape, like to get the minimax estimator in let's say mm -hmm. the uh, the normality problem or the uh, mm -hmm. entry problem, like how, how computationally intensive are these? Uh, so actually, as I was saying, the normality problem is uh, very simple. Uh, we were able to use symmetry to reduce the problem. Yeah. In fact, uh, it just takes like a couple of minutes to solve the problem. I mean, it's very, uh, it's just a simple problem in our case. Yeah, what yeah, about that, the, what about yeah, the, the entropy uh, estimation? I think it take, it took us around for a 200 dimensional problem. It took us around uh, one day, I think, to solve uh -huh. the problem. Yeah. yeah. Is it supposed to be exponential in D? I mean, worst case? The worst case, it would be exponential. I think that's where we need to rely on the problem structure and uh, some other properties to reduce the complexity of these update steps. And I think that's where the crucial uh, challenge would be, yeah. yeah. Um, hi, uh, Haru, it uh, seems to be a yeah. very, very nice talk, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask in general about like, because your work uh, and you also showed that like this could be like you are working on it extensions to GANs. So because uh, you said like uh, uh, while uh, taking the minimum of the thing, you said like Q is a linear function and that's why you could actually uh, like take out the minimum by looking only at the corners. Mm -hmm. So if, if uh, like, uh, is this the limitation why yeah, this result could not be extended directly to GANs because they have an inherently nonlinear stuff in between? Uh, actually, not true. This result holds even for GANs. So even in the GANs case, uh, this theta hat 
maybe non-linear, but the distribution over theta hats is still a linear function. I mean, it's still a linear function in the distribution over theta hats. So it, the result holds even for GANs. Um, yeah. So oh. in fact, this holds for general non-convex, non-concave games. Okay, so uh, uh, like, uh, can we hope uh, to get, because uh, GANs have a very, very, like a, a, a problem of getting stuck in a local minima. Mm -hmm. And like they do not solve it, like they have a, a couple of several issues associated with them. So do we expect like this is going to solve that problem at least? Yeah, so I think GANs uh, have a lot of other issues as well, like mode collapse and other things. Uh, yeah, I definitely feel uh, this is a way to resolve some of those issues actually. But the only difference would be in traditional GAN training, you try to converge to a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. By pure strategy, I mean, you just output a single generator, uh, theta hat. Whereas okay. by using this algorithm, we'll be outputting a mixture of our generators. So I don't, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you are okay with having a mixture of generators, then I think this is definitely going to be better than existing uh, techniques. Yeah. So uh, can we say that like uh, this, uh, because we are outputting a distribution over uh, like the estimators, so in some sense, like that accounts for uh, the mode, uh, like whatever mode collapses that happen, this, like the distribution actually makes up for the mode collapses for different generators. Yeah. Can we yeah. say that? Yeah, I think uh, that might happen. That's my intuition too. It might help in some cases with mode collapse. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 That sounds perfect. Like that's, uh, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So you're you're finishing up your PhD at, at CMU, is that right? Yeah, 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 I'm finishing. Yeah. I see. What's yeah. next for you? Uh, yeah, I'm still looking at the options. I have some options. I still haven't decided. Uh -huh, I uh -huh. mean, uh, yeah, I applied for a few postdoc positions and for industry labs, uh, Google Research, and other places. Right. Um, yeah, I'm still deciding what to do among all these options. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to reading. I saw, saw you have a paper in JRSSB on robust yeah. uh, statistics. I'm looking forward to reading that. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so do you work on robustness? Uh, well, I work on semi-parametric inference. I see. Okay. So, so uh, a lot of influence function-based um, yeah, yeah. estimation. See double mm -hmm. machine learning, sample splitting, that kind of thing. I see, I see. I work with Edward Kennedy at C CMU. Oh yeah, yeah, you, I know, you know Kennedy. Yeah, 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 I see, thanks. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I've got a, a quick question uh, that I also send on uh, chat. Could you please explain uh, a bit how the domain of max tends to a one dimensional domain? under the orthogonal group transformations? Um, yeah, so as I was saying, uh, if the game is invariant to some group transformations, uh, the effectively all you need to care about is the, okay, let me go to that slide once. Uh, yeah, so effectively all you need to care about is the equivalence classes of theta under G. So let's say the theta is capital theta is an L2 ball. Your parameter space is an L2 ball. And let's say the group transformations are orthogonal group transformations. Uh, then the equivalence class, I mean, roughly sim using symmetries, you can roughly see that we don't really need to worry about all the points in the, on the ball. All you need to care about is any one point on the ball and it will give you a good picture of the rest of the points on the ball. So in that sense, it's a very, you can uh, transform it to a one dimensional problem, which depends only on the, your norm of your feature vector, uh, norm of the parameter vector. Uh, am I clear? Uh, on... yes. uh, in fact, the question is uh, why the equivalence class is only one dimensional? I see, why is the equivalence class one dimensional? Uh, so yeah, so if you, again, take the case of L2, uh, theta being a ball, L2 ball, and G being orthogonal transformations, then uh, essentially you can take points on any particular sphere of certain, a shell of certain radius, 
then all those points belong to the same equivalence class. By that, what I mean is you can transform one point to another using these groups.